Good morning. Welcome to our Lord's house at St. Paul on this fourth Sunday of Easter. We're here because Jesus is risen. risen Alleluia. Amen. And as God's people gathered here and also online, as we prepare to worship our Lord, hear his word and come to his table for receiving Christ's body and blood for forgiveness, strengthening our faith and also proclaiming his cross and his tomb that's empty to the rest of this world. We're here and as we prepare would invite you to fill out the attendance pads that are at the ends of the pews and, and join in the fellowship with that. And uh, please update any contact information that may have changed over, over the recent time, as well as guests and, and uh, members alike. Please do that. And um, as, as we do that, it's not only for our purposes as we keep uh, things connected, but also our synod uh, requires our, our statistics of how many are in worship and so forth, so it certainly helps with that. And if you choose not to do it, maybe we should ask the people next to you to see if they know your name and they could fill it out for you. <laughs> One way or the other. Please fill those out, not just today, but every, every time you're here in worship as we go forward as God's people and just to keep that lighthearted. As uh, we're gathered, also we're in the midst of our being challenge. Uh, this week is prioritize prayer. And just as uh, we were following throughout the Lenten season of watch and pray with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we continue to learn how Jesus prayed and how he calls us to talk to our Heavenly Father and to him and the Holy Spirit in our walk with him as we prioritize that habit. Books are still available if you haven't picked one up yet, and, uh, and if uh, you don't have $20 with you today, that's okay. We know you're good for it. You can, you can bring that in later, but take the book, and it's not too late to catch up. Remember, discipleship is lifetime, and so it's just a constant daily thing, and it's not too hard. There's calendars back there to just see where you are, but also where to go, and then always certainly go back and review these challenges these days as we live our life as God's disciples. Also would like to remind you that next Sunday after the service is our quarterly voters assembly and please do stay for that. Also there are uh, packets on the back for you to pick up and take home and read through the week to prepare for that meeting and encourage you to, to come for that next week. There are some posters in the back and some more will be explained about this next Sunday during the voters meeting. But with the, the survey we took, the worship enhancements, the other life uh, portions of here at St. Paul that we're looking at, how do we continue to grow as God's people? There's a few posters to catch your eye and see some opportunities for participation. We need you to use your gifts. You said in the survey you know your gifts, so let's put them to work. And so please do check that out, and, uh, and then again, more information will be coming on that next week. But uh, there's the start for it, opportunities to serve as God's people as we live these habits as Jesus' disciples. When with that, let's stand, let's greet one another as the people of Christ, and let us worship. Join in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day, this little Easter, and also this week. And Lord, we ask that as we go through this week, we keep your word, your name, first and foremost in our hearts and in our minds, and then as we talk with you, carry on those conversations throughout the day, seeking your guidance, and also watching and listening for your response. Lord, we ask that you bless this time as we bring you our hearts as we hear your word, as we offer our praises and ourselves as those living sacrifices. In your name, Christ, we pray this. Amen. We continue with our opening hymn, Lord Jesus Christ, be present now, a prayer that we pray and we know is answered by his saying absolutely, hymn 902.
We begin as we were baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let us humble ourselves then before God, confess our sins to him, and pray for his gracious forgiveness. O Lord, God Almighty, we confess that we are sinful human beings by nature and by deed. We have not put you first at all times. We have not followed in the ways you have set forth for us. We have not always been thoughtful caretakers of your creation and have not shared its bounty on all occasions. We have not kept our thoughts, words, and deeds fully pure and honorable. We have sinned in ways we know and in ways we do not even recognize. We have not honored those in authority and have not without reservation encouraged them. We have not completely put the best construction on all things and on all people. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Forgive us all our sins. And finally, by your grace, bring us to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We join in the intro it from Psalm 23 and John 10 together. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. And I lay down my life for the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me and I lay down my life for the sheep. The Lord, your good shepherd, be with you. Let us pray. Risen and ascended Lord, you are the good shepherd. You lay down your life for the sheep. They are yours. Empower your church to reach every sheep that belongs to you and to give witness until you have brought all your sheep into one fold. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We hear the word of the Lord. The Old Testament reading comes from 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1-11. through 11. In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. 
The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked with before you faithfully in wholehearted hearted devotion, and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend the city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, Prepare a poultice of figs. They did, not, they did so and applied it to the boil, and he recovered. Hezekiah had asked, had asked Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? Isaiah answered, This is the Lord's sign to you that, that the Lord will do what he's promised. Shall the shadow, shadow go back forward ten steps, or shall it go back ten steps? It is a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps, said Hezekiah. Rather have it go back ten steps. Then the prophet Isaiah called upon the Lord. The Lord made the shadow go back ten steps. It had gone down down the stairway of Ahaz. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. It was about that time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw this, that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out of, for public trial after the Passover. So Peter kept, was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was... Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Get quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you, around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that the, that was the angel angel was doing what was really happening he was he thought he was seeing a vision they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city it opened for them by itself and they went through it when they walked the length of the street suddenly the angel left him then peter came to himself and said now i have no now i without a doubt that the lord sent this angel and rescued me from herod's clutches and from everything the jewish people were anticipating when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also ca- called Mark, where, where many people gathered and were praying. Peter knocked out at the entrance, outer entrance, and the servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. She ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that, they, they, that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him and saw him. They were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and describe how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then left for another place. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand now in honor of our Lord Jesus as we hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 11th chapter. We just heard of two examples of prayer and how God answered those prayers. And now the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, 
Suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me, the door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he's his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. This is the gospel of the Lord. Having heard God's word together, now we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We join in our next hymn, Eternal Spirit of the Living Christ, hymn 769. Grace 
mercy and peace are yours from our living Lord who taught us to pray. And so let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as Jesus taught us as we continue to learn, Lord, continue to teach us and use us to teach others about you and how you taught us as your disciples to pray and why we pray. For those heart-to-heart -heart conversations with you, with our Heavenly Father, with the Holy Spirit, as you, our God, first and foremost in our hearts. And even when our sinfulness doesn't try to keep you there, Lord, you're there. Remind us of that. And always open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to hear your word. And then as we respond in prayer and action, let us also always be listening and looking for your answers and see even better and learn what your will is. So form our will and our ways to your will and ways, Heavenly Father. We know you're doing this. And when we stand in your way, Lord, just remind us, not only do you forgive us, but you call us to see even more closely where you're walking and what you're doing so that many more people will come to know you as their Savior and God and join us in these conversations seeking your will and your way to be done. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray that the words that I speak and the thoughts that go on inside all of our hearts and minds as we hear your word, as we ponder your word, as we pray your word back to you, May it all be pleasing, perfect, and holy in your sight. For you, and you alone, are the risen one, the Lord of lords and King of kings. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray this. Amen. As we continue in learning these keystone habits of discipleship, things that just God puts in us and become part of us, the more and more we do, they affect other parts of our lives. We've looked at choosing Christian community because God first chose us. And last week, studying Scripture, being immersed in our Lord's Word, hiding it away in our hearts and in our minds so that it come out at the opportune times as people ask questions and as we live our lives, as we give God the glory and understand His Word, our, sat our adversary, our enemy, the devil, Satan certainly knows God's, the word of God's words. And so all the more, we need to know them. So that when we hear Satan's temptations, we can say right back, this is what the Lord our God said. So stop tempting us with, God, did God really say? As we then bring him to his knees with the Lord's word. The Lord, the risen Lord, rebuke you, Satan. And so as we talk with our Father, as we talk with Jesus, as we talk with the Spirit, we think about conversations that we have with one another. And wouldn't it be awesome, you know, as we, we have this ability to just talk with God, but one of those ways that we often talk with one another is by texting today, right? So what if you could text Jesus? And due to artificial intelligence, you can. And as we look at all of these things of computerization in the world, we've got to use these tools wisely and well. They can be used for good, they can be used for evil. Now, this article from the Washington Post is titled, A New AI Artificial Intelligence App Let's Users Text with Jesus. Some call it blasphemy. Now, to be true, you're not really texting Jesus with this. But as this app works, it pulls from all of the stuff that's out there in cyberspace, cyber world, whatever you want to call it, and it says what Jesus would say. Listen to what this author writes. Asked how he defined a good Christian, the apps Jesus bought replied that such a person will profess faith in me, but also follow my teachings and embody them in your life. 
and quotes a passage in the Gospel of Matthew in which Jesus teaches that the greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Sounds like the being challenge, doesn't it? It's pulling from the word. Now you don't need that app really, do you? when you got your Bible. You got the Word of God there. Or maybe you got the Bible on your phone app. And so you don't need to ask a texting bot, what would Jesus say? How can I talk to Jesus? Just talk to Him. He hears you. He doesn't need the electronics, but He does give us the electronics to use wisely and well. And so it's interesting that, again, if you put good stuff in, good stuff will come out. If you put garbage in, garbage will come out. And so pray that these tools, as they get used, are used for good. But also recognize when they might be used for evil because all it would take is for someone to say, yeah, this is what Jesus said. And then the unsuspecting person who's never picked up a Bible wouldn't know the difference. All the more reason for us to know what God has said. So again, we study Scripture. And then we also prioritize prayer. Because Jesus prioritized prayer. It's not only hearing his voice in the word, but then also using our voices, our hearts, our minds to converse and communicate with our Father and with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. It's again something that Jesus had as a habit. And such a habit that his disciples said, John taught his disciples, Jesus, would you please teach us? And why did they say that to him? Because look at how he taught the importance of prayer. He lived it. Nearly 50 times recorded in the Gospels, Jesus prayed, or he taught about its importance. Prayed alone. He prayed in public. He prayed early in the morning and late at night and throughout the day. He prayed before meals. Remember when he multiplied the bread and loaves? He gave God thanks. Blessed are you, O King of the universe. As the head of the household would often pray before meals. And Jesus was talking to his Father, the head of the household, to feed his children. That's how those disciples on the road to Emmaus finally recognized Jesus. When they sat down to eat and He started to bless the food. He prayed. They recognized him in his habit of prayer. He prayed to his father before big decisions. And Jesus, almighty God himself, still needed his father's input, his father's guidance. And so Jesus prayed early and he prayed often. Luke tells us Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And Mark tells us very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. A solitary place. Next week, we're going to be looking at seek solitude. Again, a habit of Jesus. Why solitude? Why solitary places for prayer? Yes, we can pray anywhere. And we should pray anywhere. But when you want that deep, heart-filled, Lord, it's you and me conversations, Jesus gave us the pattern. Get off. Get to a solitary place. Minimize the distractions. Because this world is going to try to distract us. Our sinful flesh distracts us enough as it is. So Jesus would minimize those distractions. Just you and me, Dad, let's talk. Let's figure this thing out. Let's seek our Father's heart. And that's what the disciples noticed in Jesus. Yes, they saw John teach the disciples. Some of them had been John's disciples before they went over to Jesus. 
Other rabbis were teaching their followers to pray. But there was something different with Jesus. How he communicated to the Father, how he lived this life of prayer, how he expected the prayers to be answered, how he sought his Father's advice. Lord, teach us to pray. And so we also say, Lord, teach us to pray and teach us to have it be a first response, not the last resort, to seek you early, to seek you often. But if it is the last resort, he'll still listen. But he calls us, let's talk from the very get-go. Make it your priority. Now, as we look at this word priority itself, Pastor Zender in his book takes a a quote from Greg McCown from Essentialism. What does this word priority really mean? In the 1400s, it was singular. The very first or prior thing. It stayed singular until the 1900s. Oh, we're so wise as we get older and older, right? We pluralized the term and started talking about priorities. Multiple first things. We need to look at that English language again, don't we? This gives the impression of many things being the priority, but actually mean nothing is. And we wonder why priorities in life are all messed up. What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and with all your mind. Then love your neighbor as yourself. But that's still keeping with the first priority. What did he say to Martha? When she was chiding Mary and asking Jesus to chide Mary for sitting at Jesus' feet while Martha was busy about getting dinner ready. She has chosen the one thing needful. Martha, don't fuss about the doings. They'll get done. But focus on the one thing needful. Martha learned that lesson. And when she was at her brother Lazarus' tomb with Jesus, yes, she was mourning. She was a little frustrated with Jesus. If he would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But she trusted that he would rise. And she believed that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. The one thing needful. So as we prioritize prayer, Father, what's your will? That sinners come to repentance. That people come to faith. That's our Father's will. That's how we go about his business. That's why we seek his input in whatever we do, so that whatever we do conforms to his way. So that still people seeing Jesus in what we do in our daily tasks. The direction that we seek from our Father for how do we go about today? His priority. His will. And so just some questions to reflect upon. Things to talk to God about this week. It'll be good conversations because he loves you. He knows you. He knows all of us. But what is your priority? Who do you talk to most? Now, obviously, again, we don't use the electronics to talk to God, to text to Jesus, but how much do we text people during the day? How does that balance out with our conversations with God? And in our conversations with others, is our priority bringing God into the conversation some way, somehow? And what is our priority? Our priority as the church. Not just St. Paul, but the whole Christian church on earth. But yes, part of that being St. Paul, a.k.a. also known as the body of Christ. Just as Christ prayed, Is the church praying? Is this our priority? 
Where it isn't, we need to say, Abba, Father, please forgive us. Refocus us and get us going in your direction and your will because we're pulled in way too many directions by this world. So ponder those questions this week. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Wrestle with God, just like Jacob did. But notice, Jacob said, I need you to bless me before we stop wrestling. When we wrestle, we ask God to bless, and he will. And again, going back to Jesus, priority of prayer, his practice of prayer, this habit of prayer. He prayed because he needed his father's strength, and he wanted his father's will to be done. Again, go to the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. He prayed in agony, and the Father sent an angel to strengthen him. And God sends you and me to one another to strengthen us together with the Lord's word. Keep going, even though life gets hard. We know we need our Father's help and strength. And all in all, your will be done. And as we look at prayer, we talk to God because if we could do it, why would we tell, be talking to him otherwise? Other than to praise him, thank him for the abilities that he gives us. But we go to him because we can't fix some things that are broken. We can't fix them with our own power or strength. And that's why we say, God, help. God, help me see how you're working to fix this and make good out of all things in this broken world especially the things that we broke with our own power or strength. And we ask God for forgiveness. For God alone, you are the one who accomplished that on the cross. And that's why we also praise him. In addition to the help, give us strength. Lead us, Lord. We give him praise. And on day 24, we hear again, God doesn't need us to praise him. God asks us to praise him because we need it in our relationship with him. Praying to God is admitting, I need you, God. You are my Lord and my God, just like Thomas said that first week after Easter. He knew Jesus had heard his prayer. Unless I touch the nail marks and put my fist into his side, I won't believe it. Jesus waited a week. He watched over Tom, but he answered that prayer, and Thomas knew he heard my exact words. He knows me, he loves me, and he sends me with his peace. I need you, God. And so we praise him all the more. Praising him, trusting him, believing that he will do what he knows is best. Your will be done. And as you look back at this past week and your prayers to God that you offered up, if God answered every prayer request you made just as you asked it, what would be different in the world today? Some of it's taken place. Think about what has taken place in answer to your prayers. And then we also think what didn't take place as we prayed it. Perhaps our Father's will was something a little different, but it's still good even better than we can imagine. And so we also look at our prayers, what we pray, how we pray, why we pray. Why do we ask this of God? What's our intention? What's his intention? God, mold my intention to reflect your intention. Not my will, but yours be done as we close out our prayers together with the amen, with your will be done. So that you give me direction in this confusing world, God. Signs are pointing all over the place on this challenging way. What's the right way? This is a hard way. This is a difficult way. That's a slow way. Lord, give me patience for this way that is slow. The ambitious way, the easy way, the fast way, all of those different ways that the world throws at us. And we pray, Father, your way. Give me that direction in your life. Bring me this direction in a world that's confusing. 
And as we pray, it not only changes us, we see how our prayers can also impact this world that's confused. Our prayers can bring direction to a confusing world. Not by our power, but by our Father's power. And as James, Jesus' half-brother, who at first thought Jesus was nuts and off his rocker, but after the resurrection saw the truth of Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, the life. He'd probably observe Jesus praying at dinner time, growing up in the house. Jesus didn't need to be reminded by Mary or Joseph, Jesus, say your prayers. James probably did. But look at what James says. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Healed of our sin. Healed of our sicknesses. Healed of our poor attitudes. Healed of everything that would try to hinder us from walking in God's ways. And then James continues, the prayer of a, power of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We heard earlier examples of those prayers from the heart. King Hezekiah just told, get your house in order, you're going to die soon. Oh Lord, please change your mind. Don't know exactly how we prayed it, but that was the basic essence of it. And before Isaiah had left the middle court of the palace, God said, Isaiah, go back. I changed my mind. I saw Hezekiah's heart. I'll give him 15 more years. And then, Hezekiah, just so you know that, yes, on the third day, you will be well enough to go to the temple and praise me. What's the sign that you want me to do for you? Send the shadow forward 10 steps or back 10 steps. Oh, Lord, it's, it's so easy for it to go forward. Send it back. Cause the sun to retreat in the sky. You can do it, Lord. And God did. And Hezekiah was healed. And on the third day, he praised God in the temple. Elijah, praying for rain after the drought. Praying to the God of heaven in a showdown with the false prophets of Baal. They couldn't call down fire from heaven. But Elijah did. Lord, you can do it. And he did. Daniel still praying under the threat of death. Going to his window, praying towards Jerusalem, seeking the Lord's face. And he was spared from the mouths of the lions. And Jesus. We continue to see how he prays and how this world continues to be changed. And so, as St. Paul tells us, pray. Praise, all with thanksgiving, from the heart, from the head, from the spirit, all together, walking heart and mind, hand in hand, and expect an answer. And so we go back to Acts chapter 12. Peter's in prison. Herod's trying to kill him. But the church is praying. And God answers their prayers. Sends an angel to get Peter out of prison, but Peter's still thinking this is just a vision until he gets outside in the cold air. Goes to the house, knocks on the door. Rhoda comes to the door. She hears Peter's voice. She recognizes it. She runs back to the people who are praying, Peter's here, he's safe. And while they were praying, they weren't quite expecting this answer. When Rhoda said it's Peter, they said, you sure about that? God calls us, pray expecting an answer. Again, when we pray for rain, I encourage you, carry an umbrella, unless you don't mind getting wet. Because if we're asking God for rain, we're expecting him to send it according to his will when he's ready. So let's be ready. 
to have our eyes open to see his answers, our ears open to keep listening to his word and how he will respond. And then to again take everything that he answers and chalk it up in more praises. As you look at the Psalms, you see how they continuously say, this is what you've done in the past, God. I'm asking you to do it again in your own way for the sake of this world to know you. So then, as we close this out, but continue to pray without ceasing. The writer to the Hebrews tells us, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Not wishy-washy. God, you think you could do it? If you could find it in your heart, God? With confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Mercy and grace following me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We pray that expectantly in Psalm 23. We pray it every day of our lives. Your mercy, your goodness, your grace, may they follow me because, Lord, I'm going to be in your house forever where you are. Prioritize prayer. And know this, Jesus is constantly praying for you and loves you with the passion, loves to hear from you, and so does our Father. They're at work, listening, leading, and showing us what their will is for us and for all. So, blessings as you talk to God this week. Expect his answers. Expect this world to look different according to his will. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God that goes beyond all human understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our living, praying Lord. Amen. We continue our worship now as we receive our tithes and offerings for the work of God's kingdom. We'll also, uh, we'll be blessed by hearing the choir as they pray and praise God, singing for us.
choir. And as we are all bound for the promised land, we also have <coughs> our seventh and eighth grade students bound for Washington, D.C. Not quite the promised land, but it was pretty special. And so I'll just ask you students to please stand and uh, we'll send you off with our prayers. And also, if you do happen to, they're going to D.C. for the close-up program, learning about government and seeing how our nation operates. If you just happen to run into President Biden or Vice President Harris or Senator <coughs> Fisher or Senator Ricketts or Congressman Flood or any of the others representing Nebraska or other states or Supreme Court Chief Justice uh, or the other justices, please let them know you're praying for them, we're praying for them, just as Paul said to Timothy, pray for kings, princes, and all those in authority. And also, it benefits us. And encourage them as they carry out Romans 13 as servants of the government for our good. So we ask God's blessings of safe travel for you there and back again. The Lord bless your going and coming from this time forth and even forevermore. And also a time of learning as we are citizens of God's kingdom, but also this country. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon these students of ours, our children, as they go forward to learn more about how you use government to bless not only our nation, but this world. Keep them safe as they travel. Give them insights and experiences that they will always remember throughout their life so that they too, along with the rest of us, continue to grow as citizens, not only of your kingdom, but of where we live on this earth. Help them appreciate even more so the blessings that you've given us in this nation, but also how you call us as a nation to bless our fellow citizens of this world. And so, Lord, we ask that you give them an amazing week and also bring them back full of good stories, but also in growth as citizens of this nation and of your kingdom. In your name, Jesus Christ, we ask this. Amen. And now let's all of us stand as we go to God in prayer as the church. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, coming to his throne of grace for the needs of ourselves and others. Trusting in God's loving response, we pray for the church and all who are called to lives of service to God's people asking that the Lord will bless his under-shepherds and all who care for his flock. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves, that the Holy Spirit guide us into gracious ways and instill in us a holy confidence in the goodness of our God, aiding us in our prayers. With thanks for the faithful example set by those whose earthly journeys are complete and whose witness to Christ yet inspires us, let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the blessing of God upon our nation and its leaders, that we may lead peaceable lives, and we pray for the needs of ourselves and others for healing and restoration, for solace and comfort. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ, Kristen, Courtney, Haley, Kenny Kripka, Ron Kripka, Doreen Meyer, Don Sharman, Alan Legband, Bob Klitz, Gina Metzke, Eva Wickert, Jim Hiddle, Carol Schultz-Stevens, Laverna Lambrecht, Ruth Baird, Glenda Graves, Tammy Kramer, Loa Kirsten, Doug Seabrandt, Jerry Haas, Cecil Woodka, Peggy Watson, Ron Fireherm, Susie Swoboda, and Dwayne Krupka. Lord, we also give you thanksgiving for the 50th wedding anniversary of Ron and Linda Krakemeyer yesterday. Continue to bless them in their marriage as they shine your light in a world that doesn't see marriage as the blessing that you gave it. But Lord, use us all as your witnesses of your enduring love for us and for this world. Lord, in your mercy, we also pray for all who have gone to foreign lands with your powerful word. In particular, we pray for Jana Englehart and Josh Lang and family and Ruth Maita and family. Bless their efforts, Lord, and bring much fruit 
through the proclamation and the living of your word. Lord, in your mercy, these things and all else that we should have that we should have asked, grant us according to your gracious will, O Lord, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we go to you again as you have taught us, Lord Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord our God. You call us to be your people and invite us to bring our cares to you in prayer. You did so love the world that you sent your only Son to be our Redeemer. By his sacrificial life and death and glorious resurrection, he has brought us salvation and has shown us the path to life eternal. Pour upon us now the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we may receive the body and blood of our Lord with true devotion in this sacred fellowship of your pilgrim people. Grant us a foretaste of the feast to come, Heavenly Father, that we may with the increased faith joyfully await a blessed eternity in your glorious presence. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the risen Lord be with you always.
May this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you firm in faith until everlasting life. Depart in peace and joy for his service. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for having fed us with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Grant that the bread of life and blood of Christ that has been shared and received in this blessed meal be for us that life-giving food that sustains us on our earthly journeys as we serve you all our days. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord, your good shepherd, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We join in our closing hymn, Renew Me, O Eternal Light, hymn 704.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.